Good afternoon, Grade Twelves. Welcome to today's telematic session. You are back at school. You're in the swing of things. We're at least 10, 15 days before your prelims. This afternoon, we say good welcome to Ross for joining us. Mm. Thanks, Amanda. Hi, Matrix. Um, it is the last uh, sort of stretch towards your finals and your prelims. So I hope everyone's pushing quite hard and not really letting up. It's not the time to take it easy. It's the time to actually keep pushing in as much as you possibly can. Um, we're going to be doing a presentation on, say, how you're going to approach PowerPoints and how you're going to approach presenting as such. So we're going to have a lot of examples. Um, we hopefully give you some stories between myself and Amanda <laughs> that helps you remember um, all of the different concepts we're going to be going over. Okay. Right, I think we get started. It's always the best time. So let's go. First slide we have. Um, just the next one, please. Amanda, you got to click. There we go. So just an overview. I like giving this to, to you, the learners. It's just so that we can have a brief overview of where we are, where we're going, and just so we know how it's going. So we're going to be talking about flip charts, just so you know what they are. I know not everyone has at experience with them. We're going to be talk to, talking about data projectors, overhead projectors, interactive whiteboards, uh, video conferencing when you start getting into the real business world of things, how we use posters, how we use flyers, how we use handouts, um, all of those sort of things. When it comes to nonverbal, what are business reports, logical presentation techniques, how to handle Q&A, that's questions and answers, and where you should be looking for feedback. Okay, and feedback's not a bad thing. Feedback's a good thing. It's how you improve as a presenter. All right, so don't be scared of it. Um, it's something very positive. Okay, so moving on. Okay, so obviously two types of uh, presentations we're going to be talking about. Verbal, that is speaking. That is how we are presenting to you right now. We're talking to you. Um, and that is that most jobs require you to do that. You're either doing it in a boardroom or you're doing it to clients. You're talking, okay? So you've got to talk very clearly, you've got to talk loudly, and you've got to know what you're talking about. You cannot be unprepared for that. Now, nonverbal is a little bit more relaxed. There's lots of templates you can use. It's the written example of things. Um, it's when you're reporting to another department, giving them written information. You've got to be a lot more precise, very factual on what you're saying and doing. Um, so we're also going to be talking about that. Okay, so now our first one. All right, Amanda, let's see what you have to say. Today we're also looking at preparing a verbal presentation. You must have, been, you must have done this with your media research. So step number one. And very important, when we are talking about steps, remember your steps have to be logical after each other, okay? So number one, write down the purpose of the presentation. Because once you know what the purpose is, it will, the likelihood of going off tangent is less. Number two, consider your audience. And this is particularly very important, especially with the language use as well so that you target your presentation to your audience. Write your presentation with structure. Your presentation also normally follow an introduction, a body, a conclusion. Create visual aids. We'll be talking a lot about that. Practice your presentation. Ask a friend to be an audience and give feedback. Practicing the presentation and asking for feedback is important, especially in terms of time, especially in terms of how effective you are. And lastly, step number seven is on-site visits ensure all is working as it should. Grade 12 is what is absolutely important. If you are doing a presentation, go in. See if there is a data projector. See if there's slides. Don't assume anything. If you need a speaker, have a speaker set up. Because sometimes when you are presenting, you come there and then you have technical problems that could be avoided. Our next slide is Russ. All right, just uh, some things to avoid, and this is very important for you as, uh, as a presenter. Don't go over time. Okay? If you are presenting to an audience, they're expecting you to talk for a set amount of time, and they want you to stick to that. 
you as learners have lessons and you know how long they are so you should respect it as a presenter you should be the same know how long you've got to speak and stick to it don't present without preparation don't do that okay don't wing it don't just hope for the best thinking okay you know what I will just say what I say that often leads to very unstructured presentations and then your audience feels lost they feel confused um, and then that's not going to work for you they're going to often lose interest and look elsewhere so be prepared that's why in our steps we said practice you know how long you're going to be saying things um, that's why we're mentioning it there also know your audience I mean it's a very big difference between presenting to your friends and say presenting to a teacher as Amanda mentioned language um, words that you're going to be using how you saying things etc etc I'll say examples of things okay don't read from notes okay we're not saying don't have cue cards we're not saying that at all but don't read everything now all of you by this stage I'm very sure have done your media research project um, where you stand in front of the class and you're presenting your research and you will have noticed some people either putting all of the notes on the board or they're standing there with very long lists and reading off them now you know as the audience when that happens you've lost interest completely just brief notes is what you need just cues going that's what I need to say next and also not sitting with things in front of your face is also a very bad presentation technique okay so don't read from notes it gets very very boring that's why you must be prepared know what you're talking about and um, lastly don't arrive late I don't know if you're noticing but there's a lot of pu being punctual for presentations it's a very professional thing that you want to set for yourself you want to be professional then people respect you as you are presenting if you're late then they don't they'll start losing that little bit of respect that they have for you so be on time say what you have to say keep within the time and you should be quite well prepared and ready to present all right good so things to avoid very important and our next one and as the slide comes up now we're going to be talking about a range of these things and I felt it important to mention all of these um, because some schools maybe don't have this, these types of equipment or maybe some learners have never come into contact with them so we're going to mention them mention scenarios where maybe it's best to use them um, just for you so that you know all right so because sometimes questions do come up revolving around what's the flip chart how do you use it and we want you to be prepared if those do come up all right so we've got a few of them data projector overhead projector an interactive whiteboard um, video conferencing handouts all of you are very familiar with handouts <laughs> that you get from teachers posters flyers flip charts okay so let's start with the first one I think. okay here we go now I'm pretty sure a lot of people are familiar with this thing called a data projector I've included um, a few pictures one close up and one far away so you can see the effect using things like a video a sound all of that is possible with this it makes life a little bit easier um, it is available to make it a bit more real time um, presenting things with a flip chart is a bit slower whereas this is a bit more fluid you need to face your audience um, if you did use this in your media research project and you read off the board you would have noticed that people lost interest okay so you're facing away the presenting is behind you your presentation people are reading maybe some facts or looking at a picture behind you you want them focused on you okay not you focused elsewhere that would lose the whole point of it okay so back to the side so you can use a remote um, in my experience I've used a wireless mouse it just makes things more fluid keywords not paragraphs are important here why do I say this because if you put paragraphs onto the board guess what's gonna happen your colleagues the learners they're gonna read it and then they're gonna ignore you they don't want to listen to you if I can just read it so you want keywords you just want keywords that highlight exactly what you're trying to say in the most effective way possible okay this does take practice this does take skill it's not overnight so don't feel too bad okay and you want a few other things things like graphs tables very nice to use on an overhead projector most of them are color um, they do get older the bulb does go a bit funny but so nice to use for presentations 
you can do so much with them. So hopefully a lot of you did use it for your presentation, PowerPoint, all of those sort of programs. Very versatile and very useful. Okay, let's move on to the next one, Amanda. Okay, Amanda, I think you should uh, take overhead projectors. Okay, thanks, Ross. I, I just need to say our SMS number is 31498. Send us the SMS. It's lonely here in the studio. No messages today from anybody. Okay, the following one is the overhead projectors. This is the old friend of the data projector. <laughs> clear, large, and writing. Very similar to the previous one. Clear, visible charts and tables. There is nothing more overwhelming than having a presentation on the overhead projector, and it's just overwhelmingly so much work to read. So I absolutely agree there with you, Russ. You know, you need to also to keep it brief, to the point, colourful, attractive. Never obstruct the image, like has been shown here. Give it trans, give your transparency a. You know, just make your, your transparency very, very attractive, I would say, there. So that it, it serves the purpose of what your presentation is about. Our following one will be there is your interactive whiteboard, Russ. Okay, well, I'll take this one. It's a bit more modern. Um, a lot of schools don't have this, but if you are lucky enough to have it, it is very useful. It's a step ahead of your data projector. Again, you have video, you have sound, you can have video clips, you can have pictures, you can have words. It's so versatile. But on top of that, you can also now ask your audience to come along and add things to it. Or yourself can now have examples and very much live do the example on the board so that everyone can see them. I have um, a picture that you can see. Obviously now this is a little toddler. She's uh, doing what she'd like to do on the board. Now imagine that as a presentation tool. You can involve the audience. The minute you involve the audience, they're often a lot more engaging. They remember it, a lot more involved, a lot more interested. That's kind of what you want out of it. So interactive whiteboard, again, useful. Again, same as the data projector. You need to have things clear. They need to be visible, not small. Big words, keywords, and prepare everything in advance. Um, I would not suggest using a, an interactive whiteboard without any preparation. That can be very difficult and your audience will lose interest. Okay, so that's what it looks like. Um, you do get a couple of different variants um, depending where the mouse goes, where the, the sort of uh, cokey or drawing devices go, but you can get the gist of it right there. So prepare in advance, clear, visible, and now this is when we talked about your steps. Now, if you have feedback from a friend observing your presentation, now you can see the effect of asking maybe an audience member to come up and draw something on the board or do an activity and see if it works for you or not. Now, if you never did this part of the step and you tried it live, guess it might not always turn out the way you wished it did. Okay, so that's why we ask you, prepare, get feedback, try it, practice. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Oh, I see uh, Zonke is, in the, is watching the presentation. She is from Sunyongo Sin High School. Please, when you send in the SMS, just let us know in which province you are because I'm not quite familiar where this particular school is. But thank you, Zonke, for tuning in. We're also looking at video conferencing, especially now with international business being the way we do things. I mean, sometimes we're doing business all over the world with people in different time zones. So video conferencing allow us to set up, a, set up a time and a date for a conference, but we need to ensure before the time that your camera is working, the microphones is there, the speakers. Make sure you have data. You can't be setting up a video conferencing and, you know, the, the, the background work needs to be done. Before the time, you need to stipulate what time are we, are we going on um, on air or live for our conference and remember different time zones. Six o'clock in South Africa could be a different time at all in New Zealand or Australia, whatever the case may be. Moving on, as Ross said, this is the favorite one, guys, you know it. 
I was saying to my learners today, oh, they love a handout. I don't know what they want to do with it because some of them don't even want to paste it in the books, right? <laughs> I'm sure all the teachers can relate to that, but remember, keep the handout short and meaningful. Don't hand out the entire presentation because what happens is the person sits and reads the handout and they ignore you completely. Your handout should just, I often believe handout should be given after the presentation to be taken home just to reflect on it. Oh, we have Natalie from Rosendale. Hi, welcome. Okay. Ross. Now we now we're gonna move on to posters and flyers. Um, when it comes to these type of things, often they should be included as an add-on to most of the other devices that we've talked about. If you're gonna give a presentation, don't rely solely on a flyer or solely on a poster. It should be something that adds color or adds meaning to your presentation. Your flyer, now hopefully you put information that you want the audience to take home. You want them to have that information, so it should be meaningful to them once they've taken it home. Okay, not really things that are happening in your presentation too much, maybe highlights, but not everything. As Amanda's mentioned, if you're going to give the audience the information, then you've got to ask yourself the question, what are you for? Okay, so that's what you're approaching. You are there to give the presentation. You're there to give the information. So that's the role you need to fulfill. And what is your flyer doing? That's giving them information you want them to remember after your presentation. Okay, same thing with the poster. So just some things to keep note of when um, dealing with posters and flyers is be bold. Okay, you guys know posters. You want it to catch your eye. There are so many. So make it bold. Be creative. Um, don't have lengthy sentences to read. It should be easy, quick, okay, large, clear flaunt. You don't want hieroglyphics on there. You want it to be so clear that the person can look, see, oh, I like that, move on. Okay, not too intricate, please. That's one of the highlights of posters and flyers. Okay, just it does lead on to a flip chart, Amanda, if you don't mind. Now, flip charts, I've included two photos here. Um, is used in a lot of business uh, meetings and trainings and some teachers may use it and speci speciality trainings also use it. Uh, the first picture as you can see is very simple. A uh, flip chart is just a range of papers, much bigger, think of a A4 pad but much, much bigger. You are talking to the audience, you are showing information, you're working to a point that you can take their information, your information and hopefully put it together on the flip chart. It's a much more real-time sort of uh, presentation. Okay, much, you cannot really do this with large audiences. This is smaller groups. You want people talking to you, and it doesn't work with big groups. Um, it does lead on, once you've had a group for a few hours, it does lead on to the second picture, which you'll see, which is a whole room of information. Okay, so now you've taken everyone's ideas, you've made it from sort of in their heads to much more meaningful, real-time, useful information. And a lot of teachers, a lot of presenters, and a lot of trainers that I've worked with will put it on the walls so that you can keep on seeing it. Okay, it has a very powerful effect that way. When someone says something and when someone writes it down and it's visible are two different things. Um, example I've had in my history is if you are approaching a new class, often then you can use a flip chart, lay down the rules as they understand it, as you understand it, it's visible. You've now used their information, your information, and created it and made it visible permanently. Very, very useful, I do find that. Okay, some things you need to be, again, aware of when it comes to flip charts, bold. I don't know if you're noticing a trend here. Things need to be big, bold. If people struggle to read, what you're writing, it does make things very difficult. They get anxious and you lose focus, you lose attention, you, you, you lose the audience. So be bold, bold letters, use different colors. Um, the brain loves color, the brain loves shapes, the brain loves simple terms. So use it, it's a very powerful tool. Again, um, just because the flip chart may be blank doesn't mean you don't prepare in advance. Prepare what you'd like to go to into each one of these posters. What would you like to accomplish after you've had everyone's input? Okay, because if you go in there unprepared, 
that poster is going to be disorganized, there's no structure, and you have not really accomplished anything. So prepare in advance. Again, simple as possible. Okay, so those are all um, tools that you'd be using as a presenter in different situations. Um, I hope that it helps so that you can see the pictures, see what maybe you've been exposed to, how it should have been done. And I do find a good thing to do is now think back on your media presentation. Did you do any of that? Was your presentation bold? Did you use keywords? Um, did you speak to the audience? What did you do? That's your own personal inner feedback that I think is very important. Okay, so those are that. I think let's move on, Amanda. Something very interesting with the media research that I found was that um, they spend a lot of time doing animations and transitions, but they sometimes like totally forget to edit their work. Ah, completely agree. Which is so important. I mean, it's not one of the points, but I believe in doing your multimedia presentation. Edit your work. I mean, it says so much. That, mm. I mean, that is the final touch for me. I've had, a, I've had students before do cartoons. Now, illustrations are very useful, um, but again, didn't prepare. So the illustration was lost on the audience. So oh, it just falls through. It does fall through. So unless you prepare, you know where you're going with something, rather just stick to the rules. Much, much more easier. No, absolutely. Presenting non-verbal information. Step number one. Remember I said with the steps, make sure that your steps follow. And grade 12, this is such a nice way I find for, to study, especially for those visual learners. You just make it so easy if you have a mind map going to, and in the exams you think back on what you had on your mind map and it just makes it so easy uh, to study and recall the work. Step one. Plan carefully. Plan what would you want to put into your report. What do you want to put in your PowerPoint presentation? Number two, we write concisely. Simple language. We keep it short, keep it simple. Remember who your audience is. Step number three, use plain language. I find sometimes with the PowerPoints, they use this big concepts, terminology totally out of context because it sounds nice. Keep it simple. Once again, use visual summaries. Visual summaries include your pie charts, include a graph, make a table, just the way you lay your information out. Look like in this particular slide. Look how nice the, the steps, you know, what follows the arrows. It just has such a logical conclusion to this. And the last one there is, Ross, use a simple layout and edit your report. Okay, what I've done here is um, a lot of people like to use tables, diagrams, and illustrations. Um, different circumstances, different times, different requirements depend what you're going to use. Now, I've shown you what a table, I think a lot of learners know what a table is. I've just put a little story there together for you. Most tables I've got there is I am a table, I organize information into categories, and it's usually a lot of information. We're not talking very small amounts, it's usually a lot. I present that information, but I can get boring. Okay, so when talking to your audience, you don't really want to show them tables upon tables upon tables. You want to use it maybe as evidence and highlight something in a table, but you're not really there to explain the whole table. Okay, so it's very important. Um, it is useful to categorize things, show how everything is organized with large uh, uh, information bundles, but it does get boring. I mean, you sit in, in a presentation, and if there's just tables, you will lose the audience. Okay, the other two that I've got, and my favorite one I'll start off with is, I am an illustration, I tell a story. Now, this illustration that I've got down here, and if you look very closely, says a lot. Now, if I'm presenting with this uh, illustration, I could be talking about saving money. And now you can immediately see, to save money takes many steps, and the money grows slowly and slowly. So, the illustration fits in with what I'm saying. It helps me tell you a story. It is not off topic. It is right there for you to see what's going on. Um, it's simple. It's not too cluttered. It's bright. It immediately catches your attention. So that's what you want from an illustration. 
it helps you tell a story and it helps people remember. You think of uh, childhood stories and the little very simple pictures that they had in books. This is what illustrations kind of bring forth in your memory. This much more simple illustrations will stick with you much longer than any table will ever. Okay, but think concepts when, you, when you're thinking about illustrations. If you're very good at drawing, I suggest half the time use it, making your own illustration. All right, but there are programs and apps, etc., that can help you there. Okay, the third one that I have is a diagram. Now, I threw this one in here because I thought a lot of you um, will remember from grade 11, marketing mix. Um, diagrams aren't quite like illustrations. They're very simple. Simple shapes, simple colors, putting information straightforward to you. Okay, so a diagram, simple, no elaborate storylines or more complicated storylines, just simply taking information, putting it into a shape essentially, and shapes help. Because the human brain, as I said, doesn't like lines and lines and lines of text. The human brain likes shapes, likes putting it together so that you can remember it. Uh, I would also add a lot of color if you could. The one I've got on the slide for you is very plain. I did that deliberately so you can see. If you add shape, makes it a bit more memory. Add color, even more memorable. Okay, so those are the three that we've got that you can often use for, I would say, even verbal presentations. But in nonverbal, it makes it stick a bit more when someone's reading through it. Okay. Okay, now the next one is all graphs. Now, when it comes to graphs, and when, we, when you see when we go through the consolidation questions, graphs do come up a lot okay so we're going to spend a little bit of time here um, i don't know what you've done at each and every school so we're going to try and get as much in here as possible but the three basic ones that you should have been exposed to or should have been exposed to in uh, numerous types of settings are the following okay we have obviously a bar graph which is the one on the top right corner it has bars and that can present series of information into different categories. Um, you have a line graph. As you can see, it has lines. The great thing about graphs is often they're named exactly what you can see. And the one at the bottom is not a wheel graph, that's a pie graph. Okay, so pie graph is the bottom right corner. Um, in the middle, we have a line graph. And the top right, we have a bar graph. Three different ways of sharing the same information. Now, you're asking, which one should you choose? Now, that one is all dependent on your audience. All right, so it does depend on who you're talking to, how you do on a display it. Um, maybe a pie graph for some people is more easier, but that does mean you need to prepare in advance. Know who your audience is, know which one might be better for them to actually see. All right, so I think, Amanda, let's just go back. I just want to talk about the... All right, so as you can see, pie graph, often at a glance, you can see who's sort of dominating a market. So if you're looking at sales um, that I've got there as an example, the pie graph, you can immediately see where the most sales are going. So for that sort of thing where you want people to immediately know something good, I would say, you want a pie graph. But often when you see uh, business presentations where they're trying to sort of I don't know, hide information or change information a bit, they will tend to go with the line graph because at first glance, it is a little bit more confusing. But what it does do for you is it shows trends. And I don't know, you, most of your matrix should be into investments. They love these types of graphs, line graphs, showing your investment growing, dropping, growing, and growing in the long term. Okay, so that's where you see it a lot. Um, the top one, the bar graph, is nice when you want to compare different things. How did it look this year versus last year, the year after that? So depending what you're trying to convey depends on which graph you're using. Okay, the consolidation question I think later we'll spend a bit of time on that and we can actually apply it to a question. All right, okay. Let's move on, I think, uh, the next one, Amanda. Yeah, just before we do that, Ross, Hello, good afternoon to Natalie from Rosendal High. We have a Val Rees Technical High School in the Northwest Province is viewed, is watching. We have Ritfle High in Rich in the Northern Cape is tuned in and enjoying the session. 
We have quite a few learners from St. John Gore School. We have Asukile, we have Thembakile, we have Zonke, and we have Natalie from Rosendal High. Great Wales is great that you are sacrificing your afternoon to be tuned into this. You can also, from tomorrow, it will be available on YouTube. So you go type in telematics, business studies, and there's quite a, a lot of videos available on various topics. We're moving on. We're moving on to the logical, non-verbal presentation. It seems Ross kept all the steps for me to do today. <laughs> <laughs> Step one. It's, and it, this is very repetitive. I actually said to my great trials when we were doing this that a lot of this is very common sense. You just need to think about it. So if you're in the exam room and you're overwhelmed with it, sit and you will see most of them are... It just makes such absolute sense. Consider your audience once again. State what your purpose is. Prioritize your information, the most important information you put first. Use your visuals effectively. Um, conclusion must summarize your findings. For me, a very good non-verbal presentation is the annual reports that companies have. I mean, you look at companies like Woolworths that do the annual report. You will see when it starts and it consider the fact that it will be shareholders and prospective investors that is reading this. They use a range of visuals. They use these tables they use, these illustrations, mm -hmm. these photographs. Like the CSI projects, they will show photographs of that. They will have their tables um, between year to year. You know, the comparative results that they will use bar graphs, they will have interesting tables. I find they use, if they want to show you like in Woolworths, which of the different shops in Woolworths that they have or which brand in Woolworths is most effective, they will show you what percentage is Studio W, what percentage is Country Road, what, um, and so the, the, the whole layout of this, you can see there's a lot of thought that goes into it. I mean, the printing, the glossiness, absolutely, it's a pleasure to read these business reports. And this is a very good example of that. All right, now, the one thing that I find a lot of learners get very uh, sort of worried about and nervous is when you're doing the Q&A. The Q&A is the questions and answers. Now, this is verbal, nonverbal. It does sometimes scare you because you think maybe I left something out, maybe I'm wrong somewhere. Now, we're just going to give you some highlights how to approach that. But again, it's all about preparation and just remaining calm. All right, so let's go through some of those points. Okay, number one, try and prepare for questions. Again, just like we said right in the beginning, there are steps. Um, and one of those is to just have a sort of mock session with a friend. Now, if that friend picks up some questions, you're prepared. But if you're never prepared, you're not going to be able to answer those questions quickly. So try to think for yourself. Maybe use empty chair or one of the other creative techniques and think what questions could come up. Okay, number one, don't think that no questions are going to come up. They will come up. So prepare for as many as you possibly can. Right, so prepare. Um, another interesting trick that a lot of uh, presenters do They'll say, right, we have 10 minutes for question time. Limit the question time as much as possible. Um, when you make it too long, it might get a little bit drawn out, and your audience, once again, is now lost. So keep questions to a very specific time um, and very limited. Not endless questions. It does get repetitive, and a lot of people then get bored. Okay, and most of all, remain calm. Remain open. Um, you don't want to now stress about things. If you are starting to worry about your words, slow down, breathe, and carry on. Okay, so that's very important when approaching questions. The other next point that I have is listen carefully to each question or read each question carefully. And why do we repeat? Now, a lot of the time you'll hear a presenter say, um, do I understand that you're saying this? and then repeat the question. It's just to make sure that I understand your question and that you know that I understand that question. And there's no miscommunication, there's no 
lost in communication because often it might be in an amphitheater and the person's so far away you can't hear them but by repeating the question you know that you are answering the right question and the person asking it they themselves are confident that you're answering the correct question so make sure that you do that repeat listen carefully and then there should be no problem there okay so those are the two steps that I managed to again cover and you know if you are worried about answering a question as in you don't know what to say it is okay to pause just for a brief while we're not saying for five minutes we're saying just a brief moment just to collect your thoughts think through it and go you know what this is the answer okay there's no points for being the fastest or the quickest person to give the answer there are points however for giving a very careful and comprehensive answer which is much more effective than just saying the first thing that comes to your mind which can lead to problems okay so those three things we move on if you do not know the answer admit it okay so if you don't know as a presenter for instance they're asking you a piece of information that you really don't know and it's some report that you looked at but you don't know it is very much okay to say I admit I don't know it um, but often you will have to say look if you give me some information I'll be able to come back to you on that specific question um, I have seen in my past at presentations they'll have what they call a parking lot which is just a space where they can put questions and then come back to it later so just be open about it a sort of lying or or manufacturing an answer out of thin air looks very bad and it doesn't look very professional on you and it is not professional so avoid it completely okay just admit you don't know it move on okay people are human and they will understand okay and then the last one I have yeah for you is if you have made a mistake apologize I'm sorry for this um, uh, this 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 for instance if you didn't do a technical check the day before and now the computer's not working or your PowerPoint isn't working or something like that then you apologize say sorry I apologize for that error this is how it should be and then move on okay people again are human they will understand um, but if you just ignore it and move on people get upset okay so just again if you made a mistake maybe even I'll give an example a lot of presentations miss misspelling a person's name or saying someone's name wrong you often want to just say I'm sorry um, this this and this I hope this is correct okay just move on it makes keeps people much more relaxed Ross I think the worst thing a person could do in a presentation or in a question time is to be defensive very much so um, a lot of speakers that I have um, seen in the past when they become defensive it just spirals it becomes and just out of control borders on rudeness at times as well yeah. and i mean as teachers we've all been in that situation where a learner asks you a question and it's like i really don't know and i mean sometimes i think you just keep it real and you say i don't know give me a day or two I'll, I'll find out about it i'll see what we can do and i think it's also a very good lesson for them to learn as well yeah i think most times with questions learners get very scared um because they're young they don't know they're not comfortable with being wrong sometimes and that's why we're saying yeah just be okay admit it it's a lot better just admitting it and moving on and also it's very important to realize there could be another opinion oh yes i think opinions are often underrated you've got to admit if your audience member has a different opinion that's okay you know if they have factual that supports their opinion you must accept it oh absolutely as they say, seven plus two is nine, but so is five plus four. <laughs> Here's a question for you, Ross. It's Timber Kelly, she says, when preparing presentation, what type of tone should we use in terms of communicating or communication level with the audience? That's an interesting one. Mm -hmm. um, again, I'm gonna say it is very dependent on your audience and it does depend on you. I feel um, a lot of speakers if they're talking to if you take a teaching environment has to be very formal and very specific now when you take like for instance I think a lot of you have probably been introduced to TED talks or those type of things yes um, it's a different tone it's a lot more casual 
they're a lot more f informal. Um, the main thing is just to be comfortable with yourself. I believe in most presentations, if you're comfortable with the way you're talking, you're comfortable with yourself, often it portrays a better energy. And you see it. I mean, you look on most uh, talk shows where the person's relaxed and they're just presenting how they want to present. I think that's a lot more important than being too formal a lot of the time. No, I think it's so as well. And I think it's also good to keep a sense of humor. Oh, yes. You must uh, be able to laugh at yourself. The, be the best presenters are often the ones who are just relaxed and they have a joke or two and they're prepared to laugh at themselves a lot of the time. No, absolutely. Here is the feedback. Feedback is very... Feedback is like evaluating yourself. It refers to information about the response of people to a presentation which can be used as a basis for improvement. So feedback like typically would be like tomorrow we would go back to school and we would tell our learners, so what about the presentation worked well for you? Where can we improve? What did you like? What didn't we like? Was the pace too fast? Was the pace too slow? But if you ask the question, then you must be open to the answer that you are going to receive. So have feedback with a tick, like normally you ask the question and a tick. Do not become defensive with negative feedback. And this is so important. Because normally, you know, our first response is always to be on the attack. So we will not become defensive, we will listen and you ask yourself, does the person have a point? And if they do, you need to concede to it, right, Ross? Uh, you do. Um, but again, with the, just the feedback forms, you want to think about it in advance, I think, quite a bit. You want to have targeted questions to try and get the information you want from them, be it negative and positive. No, absolutely. Because, as you say, accept negative feedback graciously. Ask them for the input, thank them, and move on. Okay, so yeah, just very important, um, just with that feedback, use it. I think I just to quickly talk about it. A lot of feedback, I think um, people are scared of it, they throw it away, but it can improve your presentation quite a bit. Just hearing, I mean, I think, I think it was our first presentation, Amanda, people said we spoke a bit fast, so we tried to slow things down. It's because we want our presentation to be better. So just something to think about. Feedback is useful. Take it, use it. Okay, now, improving presentation, I have a nice little arrow graph for you, um, is exactly that. Identify what you did right, what are your strengths, so what did you do right, what was so good, what did your audience remember, and what were your weaknesses, what did people criticize you for, did they say, oh, you spoke too fast, or uh, the wording was a bit too small, or you take it with your stride. You want your presentation to be better, okay? We're not doing this one time. We want to continuously want to build on ourselves. So what are our strengths? What are our weaknesses? It's almost like a SWOT analysis, I would almost say. What did you do right? What did you do wrong? Okay, so that's the first thing. You need to identify all of that. And if you're not honest with yourself, you're not going to identify the real weaknesses and the real strengths. Okay, so just be honest. Say, okay, I should have spoken louder. I should have done better with my presentation. I should have prepared better at the end of the day. Okay, the next step that we have is uh, list the weaknesses and then write next to them suggestions. Okay, very simple task, but very necessary. What were the weaknesses? Okay, this, this, this. What suggestions can I personally make to make them better, to strengthen them? Turn that weakness into a strength and your presentation will only get better and better and better. Okay, you see, all, presenter, all presenters, all people that speak to the public, it didn't happen overnight. It took a lot of feedback, it took a lot of review, it took a lot of steps to get there. And we're giving to you just some of those steps that you may use to get better and better. Okay, so make suggestions is a very good idea. Okay, so our third step is... Write down everything that you possibly can think of. Um, I find that as learners, maybe you just want to give a very quick answer. But is that everything you could have come up with? You know, could I uh, yeah, change the graphs different ways? Could I have tried maybe a video? Could I have tried um, having people interact with me? You know, just different things. Have all the suggestions there. Write them down, brainstorm, ask friends, ask family, just get them down so that you can be better.
Okay, use your resources at the end of the day. Okay, so that's the third step. The last step is very, very straightforward, I feel, is incorporate these new suggestions. And the best of all the suggestions you wrote down, take them, add them into your presentation, make it better. Okay? Now, a lot of you will be going, okay, but do I go back and redo those steps about practicing and, and checking with, yes, you do. Every time you're changing something, you want to go back, test it, try again, and see what the effect is sort of live. What's that person thinking? And live, I feel, is the best. You can ask someone right there, what did you think about this graph that I made for you? What did you think about what I just said? Do you remember what I just said? I think that's a brilliant question, Amanda. Teachers use that all the time. <laughs> they ask you, what did I just say? And it's not to do with often, they just want to see that you're listening and that the information is becoming memorable at the end of the day. Very powerful question. What do you think at the end of the day? Okay, so those are just steps that you want to follow in improving a presentation. Okay, so now we've got some questions. And uh, Amanda, just lead us through some of these questions. Uh, we're going to go step by step. I think uh, when it comes to data presentation, it might be a, a sort of a, not a high percentage of the paper, but I think it's very important that you uh, tackle it. Okay. Oh, no, absolutely. And Great Twelve's business information, typically Section B question or a Section C essay question. In Section B, you often get one like this. The graph below represents the test scores of four grade 12 learners. Study the graph and answer the question that follows. It's very seldomly that you will be given a question and say, explain what is a pie chart, explain what is a, a pie chart or what is a bar graph. And you'll always have an application question like this. Identify the type of graph illustrated above. All of you are either doing maths or maths lit, so you should know this answers. This is this is giveaway marks. Question one put two. By assessing the graph, determine who had the highest percentage in test three. Oh, hang on a minute. But shouldn't we ask uh, maybe someone to SMS in what type of graph that is, just to Un check? Yeah, unfortunately, we don't have much time with us. Okay. We only have the last five. So basically, I just want to say you will get a graph and you will get questions based on this. Quickly, I just want to... To, to look at a typical section C question over there. You could, I mean, most possibly you could get a essay question on business information. With a very important year, remember grade 12, so you must have an introduction. You must write down the word introduction. Your body, your conclusion must be, the word must be written down. You need to have a sentence below it as well. Please, you need to refer to current examples to get originality marks. And if you look at this case study, they give you the bullets. Those bullets, that is the headings that you need to have in your essay. Because those headings will give you your analysis marks. So, as I said, we, we have two minutes before we wrap up. Great 12, what I need to say to you, this is one of the most... For me, it's the most nicest topic in, in the grade 12 syllabus. I think it's just so easy to relate to you. Be, you it's easy to understand. It's easy to answer. This is, the, this is the section of the work where you could possibly gain your marks. Do you think so too, Ross? Uh, there are easy marks to gain, so you should go over it. Um, I do feel a lot of learners neglect it um, when it should be very much, I'd say, cake marks. It's for you. You know your work. You've got the marks. All right, so I just feel that uh, I think Natalie got the right answer there, Amanda. I'm not too sure. Yeah, it is. Natalie said <laughs> it's a bar graph. So grade 12, last 15 days before the prelim exams, as Ross said earlier, now is the time to dig deep, be focused, be working, make sure that all your, your projects should be almost finished. Because once we finish with the prelims, we'll be back at school a week and then we start in final exams. Your preliminary exams means this is your trial. Your trial for sitting your main exams. You need to go over all your topics. Your business environment, your business ventures, business roles. And the last one is your business functions. Yes, very important. Just keep pushing through. Keep pushing. As many Red Bulls as possible. <laughs> oh, yes. 
Grade 12s, and you know by now that there is no September holiday for you. You people are working right through the holidays. We, via our telematics team, we are doing this because we want to help you to get a better mark at the end of the day. And we also want the best results possible because your grade 12 is just your, your vehicle to reach in your dreams that you want to reach. Okay. Yes, Matrix, just keep pushing at the end of the day. I don't know how much time we've got left. Do we say bye now? Or? Yeah, all right, yes. Well, thanks, Matrix. Just keep pushing. Uh, I'd like to thank you for your time. Just have a great afternoon. Just keep studying. And uh, goodbye. <laughs> From Mars. <laughs>